Have you ever paused to think about how something, well, seemingly abstract like political uncertainty could directly shift the price of your morning coffee? Or, you know, the gas in your car. Exactly. Or even the metals inside your phone. Huh. It might feel like these are completely separate worlds, but as we're about to uncover, they're actually deeply, maybe surprisingly, intertwined. That's absolutely right. Political uncertainty isn't just about the headlines you glance at. It's about the very real potential for policy shifts. We're talking about changes in trade rules, maybe new taxes, regulations, even geopolitical tensions or conflicts that can really disrupt both supply and demand for essential goods globally. Exactly. So today we're taking a deep dive into a really fascinating comprehensive study from the Charles A. Dice Center for Research in Financial Economics. A great piece of work. It really is. This research digs deep into how political unpredictability actually shakes up commodity markets, creating you know, measurable ripples. Our mission here is to give you a shortcut to truly understanding this critical global dynamic. Yeah, we'll unpack the core theory behind it all. And the clever empirical strategy they use to find their answers, the striking results, and even some of the unexpected twists and nuances that make this topic so rich. And we should also touch on some of the maybe limitations or puzzles they ran into, which are just as crucial for getting a complete balanced picture, right? Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. So how do the researchers even begin to model this complex relationship? They start with a core theory, building a model with a producer, a consumer, and a futures market speculator. Okay. What's absolutely fascinating here, I think, is that the direction of political uncertainty's impact on commodity prices, it depends entirely on where that uncertainty comes from. Is it starting on the demand side or the supply side? That's such a critical distinction to grasp. Let's maybe start with the demand side. So imagine political uncertainty bubbling up in a major commodity consuming country, say policy discussions in the US or Japan that could dramatically affect big industries like manufacturing or construction. Right. This makes the future demand for those commodities, well, highly unpredictable. So if you're a producer and you're looking out at that uncertain future demand, how do you react? The theory suggests that risk-averse producers, you know, the ones who want to play it safe, will actually start reducing their current inventory yeah. and selling more of their commodities, both immediately in the spot market and for future delivery. They're essentially trying to offload stock because they're just not sure if demand will be there later. Yeah, makes sense. Hedging their bets. And of course, this increases the immediate supply available in the physical market. And theoretically, this leads to commodity prices will decreasing. At the same time, something called convenience yields should increase. Now think of convenience yields as the sort of extra value you get from having the actual physical coffee beans or oil barrels now, rather than just a promise to get them in the future. Uh, okay, like an availability premium? Exactly. It's like if producers are holding less stock and you really need that immediate supply, its availability becomes more valuable. The theory also predicts that risk premiums, that's the extra return speculators demand for taking on risk, would increase as producers look for more ways to hedge against this uncertain demand. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, now let's flip that coin. What happens if the political uncertainty strikes in a major commodity producing country? We're talking about things like political unrest or geopolitical tensions that could genuinely disrupt production itself. Right. And even though commodity production often doesn't change, like overnight it's often inelastic in the short term, heightened uncertainty can still make producers hesitate. Maybe they reduce future output plans, maybe even lay off workers. Mm. In response to these potential future interruptions, both producers and consumers tend to start increasing their inventories. They begin essentially hoarding. Hoarding, okay. Taking supply out of the immediate physical market to prepare for potential shortages down the line. And if supply is being hoarded, taken off the market, well, the theoretical prediction is that spot prices will rise. Makes sense. Less available now means higher price now. 
Conversely, convenience yields and risk premiums should decrease. Because if everyone's hoarding and future supply looks tight, there's maybe less incentive to hold large inventories yourself right now. And producers might need to hedge less if they anticipate higher future prices anyway due to scarcity. So this model gave the researchers these very specific, testable predictions for both scenarios. Which brings us to the next big challenge. How do you actually measure something as, well, nebulous as political uncertainty in a way that lets you isolate its effects from, say, general economic jitters or financial market volatility? Yeah, that's always the tricky part in these kinds of studies, isn't it? Totally. Because as the study points out, a recession, for instance, might reduce demand but also prompt government spending which just creates a really messy picture for researchers. Right. Confounding factors everywhere. So their clever solution was to use national elections as a kind of built-in external test for political uncertainty. A natural experiment. Exactly. Their timing is generally known well in advance, which provides a cleaner, more controlled environment for observation compared to, say, a sudden crisis. And to do this, they build a truly massive data set. We're talking 87 major commodities traded across 12 countries over six decades, from 1961 all the way to 2022. Wow. That's a lot of data points. An incredible amount of work went into that, for sure. So to really isolate the demand side impact, they focused on national elections in the U.S. and Japan. OK, the big consumer. Right. Huge commodity consumers, but crucially, not necessarily significant producers of all those commodities. They specifically chose 37 commodities where the U.S. or Japan is a top three consumer, but not a top three producer. That's smart. That selection helps ensure they're mostly observing demand side effects, not supply ripples from the same countries. Exactly. And then for the supply side, they did the mirror image. They looked at elections in eight countries known as major producers, but not major consumers for certain goods. Like Brazil for coffee, Chile for copper. Precisely. Brazil, Chile, Indonesia, Ivory Coast, Mexico, the Philippines, Russia, and South Africa. They used a sample of 26 commodities where one of these countries is a top three producer, but not a top three consumer. It's a very neat very precise way to set up their natural experiment, isolating the effects. And their key uncertainty window was designated as the quarter prior to a national election. That's the period when political uncertainty, because of the potential policy changes after the election, is expected to be highest. Makes sense. The run up to the vote. So after all that meticulous setup, what did they actually find? Let's talk commodity prices first, the big question. OK. For demand side uncertainty, so in the quarter leading up to U.S. and Japanese elections, prices of the relevant commodities on average declined by 5.9%. 5.9%. That's not trivial. And that's exactly what the theory predicted, right? Because producers were selling off inventory. Exactly what the theory predicted. Increased immediate supply pushed prices down. Okay. And for supply-side uncertainty before elections in those eight major producing countries. The opposite happened. Prices of the relevant commodities increased by an average of 4.0%. Again, lining up perfectly with the theory, the hoarding behavior reducing immediate supply. Directly aligning. It's quite striking how well the price movements matched the predictions based on where the uncertainty was coming from. What about the convenience yields? Did they follow suit? They did, mirroring the price movements quite clearly. For demand-side uncertainty, convenience yields increased by an average of 1.4% before U.S. and Japanese elections. Meaning holding the physical good became more valuable. Yes. And for supply-side uncertainty, they declined by an average of 2.0% before elections in the producing countries. Again, perfectly matching the theoretical model. So far, so good for the theory. Right. But now, here's one of the study's most, I'd say, surprising insights. And maybe a reminder that even the best theories can hit real-world complexities. Uh-oh. The risk premiums. Exactly! While the model predicted these clear shifts in risk premiums, you know, the extra reward speculators demand for taking on risk. Yeah. Up on the demand side, down on the supply side. That was the prediction. But the real market data showed almost no significant changes. The effects were economically tiny and barely strong enough statistically to say they weren't just random noise. Huh. It is interesting. So part of the theory about speculators demanding different premiums based on the type of uncertainty didn't really show up strongly in the data. Not clearly, no. Which raises an important question. Why this discrepancy? The researchers offered a few potential explanations. Okay, like what? Well, one is the whole complex idea of normal backwardation, which suggests hedgers, the folks wanting to protect against price changes, are often willing to pay a premium to speculators anyway, which can complicate things. Another thought is that maybe liquidity premiums, like 
the benefit traders get from being able to buy and sell easily might somehow offset these hedging risk premiums. Or maybe the speculators just aren't that risk averse. That's another possibility they raise. If speculators are largely risk neutral, then maybe that specific premium just doesn't materialize strongly in the aggregate market data. So it's a bit of a puzzle, a potential downside or limitation in terms of verifying that specific part of the model empirically, even if the price and convenience yield parts worked out. Exactly. It highlights how tricky it can be to perfectly map theory onto complex real world markets. There are always other forces at play. Absolutely. Okay, moving on. The study also looked at situations where this political uncertainty might hit even harder than usual. Right, specifically during economic recessions and also during really closely contested elections. Let's take recessions first. The idea here is that during economic downturns, governments are often more likely to implement big new policies, mm -hmm. right? Subsidies, new tax codes. Yeah, more intervention, which ramps up the uncertainty about what exactly they'll do. And the results bore this out. But interestingly, mainly for the demand side, for U.S. and Japanese elections happening during recessions, commodity prices declined an additional 10.0%. Wow, a big extra dip. And convenience yields increased an additional 4.5%. So the effect gets amplified significantly on the demand side during bad economic times. Why would that be? Well, it likely happens because during downturns, companies often pull back on investment, credit gets tighter, all things that make demand shocks even worse. Okay, but you said this amplification was insignificant for the supply side uncertainty. Correct. That amplification effect during recessions didn't really show up for the supply side cases. That's another fascinating nuance. Any thoughts on why? It could be several things. Maybe governments in producing countries use strategic reserves more actively during downturns to buffer supply shocks. Or international agreements kick in. Possibly. Or maybe government subsidies to producers during downturns help insulate them, meaning the market reaction isn't as severe, even with the election uncertainty layered on top. Interesting. Okay. What about close elections, when the outcome is really unpredictable? Same pattern, basically. More uncertainty should mean bigger effects. And they found that for demand-side uncertainty, again, U.S. and Japan closely contested elections led to an additional 9.9% .9 decline in commodity prices. Almost another 10% drop just because the election was tight. And a further 2.5% increase in convenience yields. So, tighter race, bigger market reaction on the demand side. But let me guess, insignificant for the supply side again. You got it. Insignificant again for supply side uncertainty. OK, why might that be? Well, similar reasons, perhaps. Governments might use those strategic reserves or economic stimuli, you know, trying to boost the economy to win votes, the political business cycle idea. To try and swing the close election. Could be. There's also a practical issue. Getting reliable polling data to accurately measure how close an election really is beforehand can be much harder in some of those producing countries. Right. So maybe the effect is there, but it's harder to detect reliably in the data for the supply side countries. That's definitely a possibility, a limitation of measuring that closeness consistently across all countries. So given all this, mm -hmm. what does it mean for hedging? You know, protecting yourself against this uncertainty. There's this common belief that precious metals like gold are the ultimate safe haven, right? Yeah. Against all political and economic risk. Did the study confirm that? Not entirely, which is another really crucial insight here. The study offers a much more nuanced perspective. Precious metals were indeed an effective hedge against supply-side political uncertainty. Their prices increased by 8.8% before national elections in those major producing countries. Which makes sense. Why? Well, supply-side uncertainty, especially in commodity exporting nations, can often lead to fears of inflation or currency depreciation in those countries. And gold is seen as a hedge against that. Exactly. So in that context, it works. But. There's a but, isn't there? There is. Here's the twist. Precious metals were not a good hedge against demand-side political uncertainty. In fact, their prices actually dropped by 10.9% prior to U.S. and Japanese elections. Dropped. So they moved with the other commodities in that case. Pretty much. It really challenges that simple gold is always safe idea. So why would gold fall if the uncertainty is in big consuming countries. The study points out that a pretty large chunk of precious metal demand actually comes from industrial applications. Oh, like in electronics. Right. And also jewelry. Demand for those things is likely to decrease during periods of high political uncertainty on the demand side, just like demand for other industrial inputs. So the industrial and luxury demand aspect outweighs the safe haven aspect in that specific scenario. 
Apparently so, according to these findings. It's a key reminder that safe haven isn't some kind of universal label. It really depends on the type of risk you're trying to hedge against. That's a fantastic point. Okay, and finally, a very practical question. What happens after the election? Do these pre-election effects just vanish? Do markets snap back once the winner is declared and the uncertainty is supposedly resolved? You might think so, but the study found that the pre-election effects on commodity markets they did not reverse after the elections. They lingered. They lingered. That's quite fascinating. Why wouldn't they just snap back? Well, the thinking is that even after a new government is elected, significant political uncertainty often remains. You know, questions about when and how new policies will actually be implemented. Right. The election outcome is just the first step. Policy details take time. Exactly. That continued uncertainty, combined perhaps with sluggish demand or supply resulting from firms' investment decisions, which tend to get cut back before elections and don't just instantly ramp up again, means the market doesn't just snap back to where it was. It takes time for the ripples to actually subside. It seems so. The pre-election shifts have lasting consequences. So wrapping this up, what does this all mean for you, our listener? We've seen pretty clearly that political uncertainty isn't just some vague concept. It's a tangible force with direct, often predictable impacts on commodity prices and those convenience yields we talked about. Yeah, and whether it's uncertainty starting on the demand side, like elections in the U.S. or Japan, or the supply side, like elections in major producing countries, the effects are often diametrically opposite, but equally significant. And we also discovered these impacts get magnified during recessions and close elections, at least for that demand side uncertainty. And that the whole safe haven status of precious metals is way more complicated than the conventional wisdom might suggest. It really depends on the context. The core takeaway here, I think, is that commodity markets aren't just driven by simple supply and demand fundamentals in a vacuum. They're intricately linked to the political landscape, to the world of elections and policy decisions. Absolutely. For anyone looking to understand global economics or even just market movements, that interplay between politics and prices is a really critical area of insight. It really makes you think, doesn't it? If the very act of preparing for an election creates such clear, measurable shifts in global markets, what other seemingly disconnected political or social events might be quietly influencing the economic world around us? Hmm, yeah. What are the other hidden forces at play that we might not even be tracking in the same way? It certainly gives you food for thought. We encourage you to reflect on these insights the next time you hear about an upcoming election, whether here or abroad or some major geopolitical development. You might just spot the ripples in the markets yourself. 